So as Cheryl came to me with this question, I thought it would be important to give a bit of scope and then also to give you some perspective as to how many sites are doing this. We were actively involved in one of the major studies for bicuspid. So the thought process and the evolution of our thinking about bicuspid valve and how we take care of it. Um, for the sake of CME, I have to disclose my conflicts. I, I do consulting for a few companies listed here, which may be germane to what we're discussing today. So with a bit of background, with the approval of low risk profile for TAVR and the continuous decrease of age of patients being treated as you see in your practices, we are gonna be confronted by a significant number of patients with bicuspid aortic valve anatomies. We learned during the studies, even for what we presumed were tricuspid anatomies, that when we went to surgery, there were many sort of forms of bicuspid that we had not recognized by simple echo and earlier techniques we used. We need to all of us use a consistent nomenclature for the varying anatomies. And then there are some sizing guidelines are important for all of us as we plan our cases. And they should be the foundation and basis for our registry as well. And I, I go to all of this. We're all very well aware, as TAVR clinical trials have moved into lower risk strata, the patients have become younger and more prevalent with low risk patients, now representing 42% of all severe AS patients. And you can see how the age has come down, not to the extent we expected, um, but in the studies, we were still confined to certain things. I think as we look at TVT and also MISHIC data, we will start to see these numbers also start to dip into the 60s. And we anticipate that most of our patients, 42% of our patients, will be low risk. Now, what does that mean? Um, as we do lo lower risk patients, and you, why are you talking about low risk? Because most of our patients will be in this domain with bicuspid. Um, when we are making a decision, the heart team should be considering, together with the patient, the following when choosing between SAVR and TAVR. The age and expectancy, right. the durability of the SAVR and TAVR devices, and so far we have really good data for TAVR devices as well. Potential need for future interventions and how we will be doing those future interventions and other clinical considerations favoring TAVR or SAVR, which is where the bicuspid domain comes in. Based on this information, the choice of intervention should be a shared decision between the doctor and the patients and um, assessing the lifetime management scenarios. So life expectancy, even for a 90 year old is not insignificant. So we need to really look um, at the, when we look into the 65 and 70 year old, we really need to anticipate that potentially many of these patients will have a second intervention. Now, we all learned in, in our training that bicuspid aortic valve disease is a congenital abnormality that affects 0.5 to 2% of the general population in the US. And I'll show that it may be different in different subgroups. Um, bicuspid aortic valve with stenosis or regurgitation is the most common reason for SAVR in patients under the age of 70. And in the US, even over 80 years old, 20% of patients or one in five patients undergoing SAVR have a bicuspid anatomy. The characteristics we should be primed for include abnormal cusp fusion, a pronounced asymmetry of the valve orifice. So when you look down the barrel, you see it's not symmetrical. They tend to be more calcified and fibrotic. They, have, they may have raffae, and I'll explain what these raffae are. And very important because this is what determines for many of our patients, whether they go to surgery or TAVR, is an enlarged ascending aorta. Put plainly in plain English, they, many of these patients have a aortopathy. And if you look on, on, on the bar graph on the side here, you can see where in the young population, 21 to 50, there's a preponderance of unicuspid and bicuspid with very small numbers having um, tricuspid elements. But if you look, as we get older, even in the populations we're seeing, the 51 to 79 and the 80 to 89, there's still a, a significant number, as we said before, about 20% or so that will have bicuspid nature. So it will, even though TAVR is, a, is, is approved for these patients, how we work them up, how we measure, and how we size our valves may be different. As I said, it depends on the geography you live in. And when, when I've proctored and I've been to Asia, Japan, and specifically China, the number of patients with bicuspid is different. I will also show you the nature of bicuspid, whereas 
in the US, we have the sieverts one and I'll explain what these things are, are more common with the right left more common. The sieverts type zero non-calcified refe is more common in China. They have implications as to how we size the valve. And you can see um, in the US, we're gonna have a mixture of all of this. Right now we say 1.6%, but as our population changes, we may see a shift in the percentage of patients with bicuspid valve. I don't want to belabor this too much, but the pathogenesis of disease in a bicuspid valve, in, in, in valvular sclerosis and bicuspid, it begins earlier in life. So when I see a patient 50, 60, even early 70s, I'm triggered to look for this. The bicuspid valve disease can progress to severe AS in a short time frame, in 10 to 12 years. The tri-leaflet valves approximately take 20 to 30 years to progress to severe aortic stenosis. So you could have a murmur for 20, 30 years if you're in the sclerotic range. But if you have a bicuspid valve, the progression, the 0.1 per year is a bit more accelerated. And while the exact mechanism is unknown and why it accelerates so much, there are genetic and mechanical components that appear very likely. There's valve and the ascending aortic tissue may be more susceptible to calcification. That's why we see heavy calcium burden in these patients, which also makes it one of the reasons why they're a bit technically more challenging to implant. And then there's because of its lack of symmetry, there are eccentric jets caused by the, the valve morphology that may increase wall shear stress, wall shear stress, contributing to the formation of the formation of. I think we need, I'm getting an echo. I'm getting an echo. Yeah, I'm looking to see if someone's not muted. Eccentric jets can cause calcification and contribute to dilatation of the ascending aorta. We all talk about the Seabus classification, and here's a, a cartoon a schematic. The preponderance in European population is the type one. So if you look at type zero, you have Two, two cusps and their symmetry. This is more like the fish eye uh, that are, for those of you nerds who, who like Lord of the Rings, it's the eye of Mordor. Um, in the other elements in the Seabus type one, you tend to have two underdeveloped cusps with one fully developed cusp and one underdeveloped and two fully developed commissures. So it just flips. The cusps and commissures just flip over each other. In type two, which we rarely see, you have two underdeveloped and one for developed cusp, and you have two raffae. So I think an image is worth a thousand words. Here's a classic C verse type zero. You have two fully developed cusps, two sinuses, and two commissures. One, two commissures. And you can see how this looks at an excision. This is from a friend of um, Dr. Watson when he was at, at Riverside in Columbus, shared these slides with us. And you can see how it looks. Here is a Seabirds type one, the classic uh, European American type with a fusion of the right left, which happens in 71% of cases. Um, and you have two underdeveloped and one for developed cusp. You see how it looks. And this is the excised leaflet, which mimics exactly here's the, the raffe, which is, is fusing the right and left. And then you have the bicuspid type two, uh, Seabirds type two. Um, you have two underdeveloped, and these are actually more difficult because you have two raffe and very asymmetric orifice. And then we go beyond the pathological diagnosis. CT has also helped us, and this has become a critical part of um, how we evaluate bicuspid. It's this nomenclature. You have type zero with no rafe, the very classic Asian type, especially in the Chinese population. You have the non-calcified rafe type one and the calcified rafe type, uh, the calcified rafe type one, and non-calcified rafe. The rafe which is calcified that is perpendicular to the orifice are the ones, as you can imagine, that are going to give you more trouble trying to expand the valve in a symmetrical fashion. So you'll have significant asymmetry in the inflow of your valve. And that is the nidus here for paravalvular leak. You can also see that the different morphologies, if you have a calcified rafe plus excess leaflet calcification, the outcomes or cause mortality at 720 days is significantly higher for this population. We have learned that some of the reason for this is that your valve doesn't perform if it is asymmetrical. So there's a significant data coming out of um, places like uh, Abbott in Minneapolis with, with Jao Cavalcante that if you do not have a symmetrical valve that is inflow at the valve portion, the leaflets tend to degenerate much earlier. 
So many of us are now believing that if you have a heavily calcified bicuspid valve with a calcified refe and you've implanted the valve, a CT at one week to one month actually helps you understand if you've achieved symmetry, because if you have not achieved symmetry, it might be worth going back in to do a balloon valvuloplasty. Clinically, how, when to suspect bicuspid valve? As I said, every young patient for me is bicuspid until proven otherwise, um, especially if they're younger than 70 with no other history of coronary or peripheral vascular disease or renal failure. A symmetry of the sinuses, you can see this. Um, it takes a bit of training, but once you get it on echo, you can see it. Um, one large and two smaller sinuses. And then the calcium overlapping the two leaflets at once. There is something also called a bovine arch, uh, where, where the left common carotid artery shows a common origin with the innominate. And when you see this, and you, when you have your 3D reconstructions of your arch, and you see it as bovine, you should have a high index of suspicion that this is most likely to live with a bicuspid element. And then the aorthopathy, which is very important because uh, you have that when you have very large sinuses and the large ascending aorta, you need to suspect that there may be a bicuspid valve. One thing you also notice is that these patients tend to get symptomatic at an earlier age, at a larger quote unquote valve size, excuse me, not, not earlier, but apart from earlier age, it's the larger valve size because they tend to have large sinuses, large aorta, also larger AIS to begin with, but the delta from their born size to the size of disease is significantly um, altered. So you may have a valve rate of 1.1, and maybe even more symptomatic than patients who you normally see with that kind of area. Echo takes a bit of training. There is the classic fish bug appearance, which is kind of sideways. And then if you can see the calcified refe, especially on CT, which is a better, better modality than TE. And this is here, if you look at the schematic, this is what we do. You can see on the still frames that you have a what appears to be a refe and, and, a, and a bileaflet element. And when you have premenstrual and you start you can start from the base in mid-systole and then scroll up and down in your aorta. You can see the beauty of where the valve is opening. So this is critically important that whoever is doing your CT measurements is doing this in a, in a structured fashion. You can locate the more, uh, you need to have the location and morphology of the cusps and leaflets. You can determine very clearly the rafe between the leaflets, the extent of calcium and the distribution of calcium and the location of the coronary arteries. And then the other critical element of CT, so CT is sort of our foundation for these cases, is there tends to be aortopathy or vasculopathy. So the anatomy of the aorta iliac elements, iliofemoral, is also could be severe ectasia in these patients and severe, so it could be also an arismal dilatation in the, in the iliacs, and then size of the ascending aorta and the coronary heights. When you have a patient with bicuspid, these are the things in a heart team discussion that we talk about. Age less than 65, surgery should be considered. Now, this is not just go to surgery and be done with it. There has to be discussion with the surgical colleagues or partners, I should rather say, of, as to what surgery are you doing? Are you putting a valve that is consistent with the needs of the patient? Are you enlarging, giving a large enough in, a valve that you're not creating mismatch at the time of implantation? And number two, now just as important, are you leaving a milieu, are you leaving an anatomy behind the surgical valve that allows us to put a tab in salve? If you have candidates for a mechanical valve, if you have extensive coronary disease syntax score higher than 22, if your aorta is larger than 45 millimeters or 4.5 centimeters, obviously if you have multi-valve disease, MRTR, we have, we're about to publish a paper from Michigan that if you leave TR untreated, with AS, the outcomes at eight to 10 years are significant, even at five years are significantly worse than if you send someone for SAVR and ring the tricuspid valve. So do not ignore the tricuspid valve. If there's unfavorable calcification patterns and you have a risk for annular rupture like that calcified perpendicular RFA, we should really think about that before you go for TAVR. Um, and the iliofemoral anatomy is hostile. And then do we have a TAB and TAB option? When you do the aortic measurements, there's usually, and this is, we order TAVR CTs, but you can get these measurements from a TAVR CT. Uh, and these are the elements, the sinus of Valsalva, the aortic root, the STJ, the length of the ascending aorta, 
these determine not only if tabber is appropriate, but what kind of device you can use, um, the arch. And, and then descending aorta is measured up to the diaphragm. There's a suprarenal element in the abdominal aorta and the infrarenal element. All these should be evaluated clearly, not only in your patients, but also probably in first degree relatives if they have bicuspid disease and aortic aortopathy. And again, um, very well known, but if you have, these are the criteria from the Europeans um, for operating patients who have enlarged aortas and bicuspids, there should be a lower threshold when you have, when you're going for surgery. And then more, more relevant to what, this is the 2018 AATS guidelines. The magic number is, four, is 50 or 45 if you're doing some other repair. And in our institution being a major aortic uh, center, 45 is the magic number we're using if you are thinking of going in for surgery. We would not send someone for surgery based on 45 alone, but if you if you are doing some other kind of surgery that's 45, we will repair the aorta as well. So now that we know the background and who should go to surgery, what do we know about TAVR? Because one of the pet peeves of many of our surgical colleagues has been that we kind of backdoor bicuspid into our TAVR indication without doing a proper bicuspid study versus TAVR versus SAVR. And, and that's very true. So the reality is though that the horse is out of the barn. We're not doing a, a study comparing bicuspid surgery versus TAVR. What do we know about it from registry? So why why did we think and why do we know that bicuspid valves are a bit more difficult than the tricuspid valve? Number one, the annulus is elliptical, so it impairs positioning and sealing. The annulus tends to be large. Many of these patients, especially if they have bicuspid with AI, tend to be out of range of our tabber sizing. <clears throat> the asymmetric leaflets or asymmetric leaflet calcification impedes symmetric expansion and may lead to gradients across the valve higher than we normally would see for a paravabular leak. The fused rafe ideal leave significant leak around it. And in this current climate, anything more than mild is something we don't even want to see leaving the lab. So we tend to be very aggressive. And during the post bath, you have risk of rupture or valve uh, or during the valve, the, during the valve after the valve, or the actual deployment if you're doing a balloon expandable valve. And then aortopathy. These patients tend to be at risk for developing aortic dissection during the procedure or a late complication, which may be missed sometimes uh, during the acute event. But what do we know? So this paper from NTS 2020, so it's already beginning to be older, dated, but, but we saw that there was no significance in mortality between SAVR and TAVR. Propensity match, so this is not a truly randomized study, but very consistent if you look at the ages, the TAVR patients were actually older. They had more frailty scores. So you would think that these TAVR patients were sicker and they are sicker. Um, and having said that, the mortality at one month and one year were very, very, very similar with no difference in stroke or heart failure. There was a single center from um, Waxman and Washington Hospital groups that looked at uh, different kinds of bicuspid CVERS-1, CVERS-0, and even CVERS type 2. And they had, um, let me see, there's a question too. So let me answer this. Do we have statistical information of the lidocrine of rupture we can cite? If a patient wants to just use surveillance of our tower of, of BAV. Um, the numbers are in high because we've learned um, initially we had some anecdotal numbers with the BAV and, and, and balloon expendable valves. But as we've learned to not oversize our, our valves in this case, and I explain how, and as we've also learned to not push till the end of our, our inflation, when we make contact, we stop. This number has significantly decreased to less than 1%. I hope I answered the question, Ms. Wyman, Dr. Wyman. And then um, this this shows. So, so Dr. Chikuti, thank you. Um, sometimes we get patients um, who are, as we all know, adamant about not having surgery. And the question is, um, they just say, can't we just watch my aorta? Like we know it's big, we know it's over say four or five and it makes us squirm in our seats. 
when they say, no, I don't want to have surgery, can't I just watch it? Are there statistics, is there statistical information that we can say, well, the likelihood of your aorta rupturing is so. I, I cannot give you the answer based on one measurement, let's say four or five. I think if you go back, if I go back here, you'll look at these. Um, the, the number, the, the, the trends that make us state that if you have systemic hypertension, family history of dissection, or an increase in the aortic diameter of more than 0.3 per year on repeated measurements, then you are at a high risk, which I can't tell you exactly off the top of my head. I can share this later on. But these are the people we, we in whom, if they, as you said, do not want to have surgery and we do the TAVR, our surveillance is in the three to six months instead of yearly. Yeah, yeah, that's because, you know, sometimes there's situations where, you know, they really are resistant and. And they um, may have social issues too, that they're taking care of their family members, they cannot yeah. do anything. So, so. Exactly. And so it's, it's, well, that's, this is what the statistics show us. If you are adamant, um, you know, I'll negotiate with you and say, we will follow you. You've got to agree to every three to six months. I mean, it's really, ultimately, it's up to the patient as to whether they're going to show up or not. But just so that, you you know, if you say, well, the likelihood of you rupturing because of the size is 10% in the next year, you know, that that's, which I just picked up those numbers out of the top of my head to be a little extreme. It's a, it's a bit extreme. The reality is you, you have to look at the whole totality, as you are saying, if they have family history, if they have other family members who have ruptured, uh, the rate of growth is the most important. I mean, if you have an 85-year-old yeah. patient with bicuspid and has a 50, who cares? It's been there for a while. And, and you've had prior CTs where it was 50. The risk right. of rupture is not significant. But if you're 65 and it's, and it's 50 and, and, and you've had aneurysms elsewhere, your risk is higher. And, and I can get you those based on and, and the, it's in the aortic literature, and I didn't prepare for it today. So I don't want to make up numbers on top of my yeah. head. But those data are available. Okay, great. Thanks. You're very welcome. So if you look at, so going back to the Sapien has good data when it comes to, um, I mean, Raj Makar and, and Dr. Toller here, this is a recent paper in 2019, shows that you, you get decent gradients in, in, in after a TAVR, good effective orifice area, and the patients are doing well. And Obviously, um, I'm going to present something. I, this is something I was involved in, and we did this also with a with a self-expanding technology. And I'm not saying one versus there's not there's no comparison. These are not comparable studies. There are different studies, but we did this here. We had the similar criteria, so we excluded if you were 45, just to so we we, we do not have long-term data for larger than 45 and bicuspid, specifically after TAVR. Uh, maybe there's something we could look at in our registry in Michigan because it'd be a good a good exercise in patients like. Um, Janet talked to us about, and then again, very similar to what we saw with balloon expandables, we have large areas, low gradients, and very limited, very small numbers of, there is no moderate AI and and mostly none to trace um, or available leak to mild. So this is very important because in the early days, if you had asked us in 2013, are we going to be able to do TAVR with a balloon expendable or self-expendable technology in bicuspid and heavy calcification? We would have said probably not. Now, another bone of contention which happens in our heart team meetings is how do we size the TAVR at the time of um, for the for the valve implantation? Because do we use the annulus or do we use the area? Let me see if this where the valve is the smallest, because the, the raffe, calcified raffe, can alter the plane of annular op of valve opening. So the standard sizing, most IFUs for a valve is basal planar per IFU. People have done this four, eight, or 12 millimeters above the annulus to estimate the orifice at various heights above the annulus. And there are other things that have been put into the equation, the commissure to commissure distance, uh, the ellipse measurement at four millimeters above the annulus, all these things that we do and should be done, I think, to also understand when you're in that zone between sizes, what size to use. And then downsizing based on the extent and distribution of calcium and length of raffe. So it is counterintuitive, but if you have a lot of calcium and you're worried about paravalvular leaks, sometimes it's better to undersize than oversize because the eccentricity is limited if, you, if there's less oversizing. 
Um, so here, I, a few examples. Will the calcium density and location impede the tap frame expansion? These, we, we consider these. Um, is the rafe, how long the rafe is and how calcified it is, and trying to overwhelm this calcified perpendicular rafe, is that going to put the patient at risk of an annular rupture when we implant? Now, we're very comfortable um, rupturing surgical valves, and, 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 and but rafes are very unforgiving because there's nowhere for them to go but outside the annulus. And then the sinus width and height, and can we accommodate the tab, but also can we accommodate the second tab? There are a couple of morphologies. This is from a registry in Europe, the Brevard registry, uh, DJ Cheche, a good, very good friend of ours, might be coming to speak for us very soon here, even in Michigan. Um, for our consortium, I'm, I'm trying the best to get him when, when he's here for TVT. But if you look at, at, at some of these measurements, it could be a tube where, where the uh, measurement at the, at the opening is the same as the annulus. It could flare like a funnel or it could flare, it flare taper. Most of our patients are tube or flare. So it makes it easier to size. And that's why um, we don't need to worry. And then one last thing, and I don't want to belabor this too much, but I think this is also very important. It just continues to really illustrate the importance of understanding the calcium. So we get calcium scores, but I think it's important in this CASPER registry, what they did was they, they indexed the calcium score to the size of the valve. So if your calcium score is more than 200 per millimeter squared, and the answer is yes, and your rafe length is more than 50% of the annulus, the right perimeter, and you, can, and you keep going yes and yes. There are certain equations how to downsize your area and your perimeter. So if you're in a in a zone between a 26 to 23 sapien, for example, um, and you have yes, 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 you should probably use a 23. And very, same thing if you have a 26 versus 29 evolute, and you're going yes, 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 and you detract these numbers. I, I, I can share this table. Um, your radiologist, your imaging, your fellows who are doing the measurements. But this is a very um, reproducible measurement that you can do quite easily, and it helps you determine what size, which they claim in their conclusions also will make the procedure more safe because it decreases the risk of annular rupture. So I think just to illustrate, because I don't want to believe, I think open this more for discussion, I don't want to occupy the whole hour with just talk and talk and talk, is I'm going to show you a couple of cases. The 69-year-old female with a long history of a murmur, and now presents to our clinic with class three symptoms. No coronary disease, just some mild impaired glucose tolerance, low risk, morbidity and mortality was 1.75, 8.63. She had no incrementals. Here's her EKG. You can see the high gradient one echo. Let me see if this play doesn't, yeah, this is supposed to play for me, but it's not doing it. Let me see. Now, this is maybe you think I'm. Um, saying a little quirkies here, but if you look at the opening up here, most tricuspid valves had to have the opening right in the middle. This seems to be a bit eccentric, leaning towards the RV, more towards the interior. That to me triggers me that this is probably a bicuspid valve because it's not symmetrical in its opening. And then we do our measurements. You can see the usual measurements we have a perimeter of 75, our area is 432, the arsenic widths are all over 29, LVOT is consistent, no calcification, cornea heights look good. And then here you can see a few measurements. This is uh, eight millimeters above, five millimeters above. So the numbers, this is more of that like square type, the Brevard type one, um, where we're looking more towards a regular, we're not gonna significantly undersize because there's not too much calcium, and at, at four and eight millimeters, we're very similar to our um, annular dimensions. Here's the elliptical opening. It, it gets to be a tiny bit smaller, but when we looked at the calcium, it's not a calcified rafe, it's a calcified leaflet. So we felt that we can expand this valve. We love the three mencio going up and down just to give us another feeling to make sure we're not missing something on those still images. And sometimes you, you, you do capture what, what in the past we've called functional bicuspid, but they're really bicuspid, not, not, not of a large extent. And then an important part, and this is, I'm sure, I mean, the implanters know this, but what we've learned is that is 
the pre-bab, whereas we've, most of us have gone away, especially with saping from pre-babbing most of our valves in the bicuspid, I feel it's critically important to pre-bab to get an, a feeling of how the balloon is going to behave, how the valve is going to behave. It also helps us if you're using a, in this case, we're using a, a super annular uh, self-expanding technology. And I'm not going to belabor this too much, but we can see how we assess for coronaries. We, we can, and I'm going to belabor this too much and release the valve. Very reassuring is that there is no paravabular leak. There is some here in this case, mild. So we, we bapped it again afterwards, no significant gradient. So we saw that paravabular leak and we, 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 we did not like it. So we did another inflation. There's two things we do when we, when we implant the valve, whether it's a balloon expandable or a superannular self-expanding or, or intraannular self-expanding. After we, we look at the hemodynamics and look at the leak, we also look at an LAO cranny and a cusp overlap to look at symmetry. And if, if, if the asymmetry is more than 80%, <clears throat> so the, the widest to the narrowest is 20% larger, we feel that even with hemodynamics being okay and with no significant PBL, we tend to bath these patients to get a more circular inflow. And then after we did that, so you remember we had some significant PBL. Now we're in the trace range. And here's our echo P discharge with no appreciable paravalvular leak. I'm very, very happy. A similar case, 66. So even though most of our registries are in the 70s, we're beginning to see creep into the 60s. 66-year-old male, had HIV infection, but CD4 count was fine. Viral load was undetectable. Here's his SDS. Um, so this, this could easily be a very good um, surgical case. EKG, again, you see the eccentricity and the heavy calcification off center. So you, you suspect that. And then when you look down the barrel, um, the short axis view, you can actually see the rafe and see the calcium. CT measurements, 83, 543. Uh, so, you know, this would have been a very good um, 29 or a 34, 29 safety or 24. It is, however, the type zero type, but what's favorable, it, it is the non-calcified type zero. As you can see, straight line. As we go up and down in Fremencia, we get our measurements. Coronaries, there is some LVOT calcium. And because of that, and because of our, first, our feeling that we might have to aggressively post-dilate, we decided to again use a superannular self-expanding. Here's the p-hemodynamics, because view again. You've seen one, you've seen them all, but again, you see the importance of the pre-bab, and we're a bit more aggressive with babbing than we are with a simple tricuspid uh, AS. You see nice sinus widths. Patient is a candidate because we've measured before. When we look at this, the yeah, risk plane is going to be here with a second taver. We are able to access the coronaries. We, we, we have enough space. The VTC is large enough. So this patient not only got a successful taver at 65, but has all the characteristics of a TAV that is amenable to a TAV and TAV. And that is critically important with new software coming out. We not only plan for this TAVR, but we plan for the second taver. Here's the echo at one month and short axis and hemodynamics look great. I'll do one more case and then we'll open for discussion. This illustrates the importance of having a, a, a good team where the surgeons are also an integral part of what you do in taver. Uh, and uh, um, you know, because I could convince everyone to get a TAVR, depending how I speak, but we really have to have an open mind. Here's the patient who's 75 years old, uh, progressive decline in functional status, a very active person who used to bike two to five miles a day, but his, his time for biking is less and decreased energy and is fatigued. Um, now has class three symptoms and an epidural hematoma in the past, but nothing really to write home about. Classic patient we see in clinic. 
low SDS, frail by walk. I, I always wonder this frailty. We seem to get everyone is frail, but they're biking four or five miles. So I don't know. Um, but it is what it is. We'll be consistent with this. Here's our echo. You have a valve of one point. As I was saying, they tend to be more symptomatic at the bit of a larger valve area. You don't see those 0 0.4, 0 0.5s. They tend to come in earlier. Um, area index is 0 0.5. Mean gradient. Here are all the parameters. EKG. And when you look at this, um, we had many things that were favorable for TAVR. You had a large um, area. LVOT perimeter and NS perimeter was decent. Um, good coronary heights, and it felt to be a bicuspid zero. But when we looked at the sinus heights and the asymmetry of this valve and the way the calcium was deployed, um, we had a very good discussion in our RT meeting, and we also included the patient in this discussion, and we felt that the tab and tap potentials were not the most favorable. Um, you know, this may also, this discussion will change significantly with, with, with more experience with Basilica and newer technologies coming out like Picardia, um, like Shortcut, which will be able to um, um, modify the leaflet. But long story short, we decided to go to surgery. So it is, like, as I said, it's not enough to send the patient to surgery, but just as we have discussed what size valve we're going to put in from a tavern and what options we have for tab and tab in the future, we also have these discussions with our surgeon. This case was Dr. Yang, um, that what are you going to do? So he did, he dissected the circumflex, which was anomalous, off the root, performed a Y incision. And even though if you look at these numbers, this patient would have got a 25 or a 23 by conventional sizing. He enlarged the aorta enough to now put a 29 magna instead of a 25 or 23 magna, which was planned before. Um, significant vision improvement, significant decrease in the risk of patient prosthesis mismatch. We know that this also leads to longer durability and also sets a milieu for when the TAVR is done, we have a larger valve to put the TAVR in. And here's what it looks like in position. Here's this anomalous circumflex below the prosthetic valve. So there is no risk of future involvement. So in conclusion, I will state this again with proper implant technique and proper planning, transcutaneous valve valves are possible with high rates of success in BAV because of the valve patients. It's important to note, as we said throughout this talk, that these patients are younger. So it's not enough for me to discuss what I can do today, but what will I do in five to in 10 to 15 years? What are the options for us, and those options are always expanding. So what I, the discussion today may be, may be very different than discussion in a year when we'll have more technologies like Picardia. And hard team discussions are critical in these patients. It is a bit controversial, but I would propose that for us to have true hard team discussions, we should have patients also involved in these discussions. And how we do this? Is still up for discussion whether we have a waiting room in our Zoom meetings and people come in one by one. It will make the dynamic of those hard team meetings different. It will also make them more laborious, and we have to understand how we do this. And then, as Janet said before, there needs to be a rigorous long-term follow-up of these patients to continue to broaden our knowledge of management strategies, what to do with aorta and aortopathy. And this is, again, I will... It may be it's, it's, it's self-serving, but it also illustrates the importance of registries like MISHIC to enable these, these, these issues to be investigated and in a collaborative way within all the sites. The sum knowledge of all of us is significantly better than, than the individual site. So I will stop here. I thank you all for your attention and open it up for discussion.